and then jump through the archives. Well, the legendary Hollywood director, Oliver Stone, is here to talk about his new documentary, South of the Border. Lovely to see you. Thank you Just Kate. picking up on, on that Mel Gibson uh, story there, because you're quoted in The Telegraph today as saying that Hollywood would forgive him. Oh, I think they would in time, yeah, because, you know, it's, an imagine it's a place of imagination. I mean, you can come up for a, ro a role for Mel. I mean, you can make him a villain. And if you do a good enough job and the film is terrifying and Mel could play a great wife beater or something, and he would probably people would flock to see it because it was interesting. That's the way Hollywood works. And you mean, it, sound, it sounds like it's sort of moral, uh, in a moral free zone where anyone well, could do anything and still if welcome. You can, if you find a way to make fun of your image and you can, you can flip it. But what's funny about anti-Semitism and the allegations about yeah, there's nothing funny about it, but his, if he played somebody hateful, somebody who was evil, somebody who was villainous, don't you think there's a room for that? I don't know, do you think the public would buy that? Would if they the movie was to? exciting, they sure would. So you, I mean, if you had a, a you know, his, the ifs, if you had a movie script in front of you and you well, looked at I would make it, no. Well, I'm just asking yeah. the question, if you had a script in front, front of you and it looked like a role there that would suit Mel Gibson, at the moment, given the press and whatever, would you, would you cast him, would you go for it? <laughs> You're putting me on the spot, you know. Listen, I think the forgiveness is an important aspect of life and we mustn't forget mercy. Quality of mercy is not strained. That's an Englishman who wrote that. Well, I'm not seeking to, you know, I'm not seeking to sort of hound him down, but I'm just intrigued. Yeah, you know, well, you were saying that Hollywood There's a lot of pounding going on in the world right now. And the U.S. has a, a, one of the largest prison populations in the world. Two and a half, three million people are behind bars. The prison system is for profit, and we love vengeance, vengeance, whether it's Lockerbie or getting people years later like Polanski. We go after people, and I think it's a wrong, it's, a, it's wrong, what's wrong with our system is it's merciless right now. So wrong lot, to bring yeah. Polanski to justice. Yes, then, it is. That. At this time, at the, and he was exonerated by the Swiss. Uh, we've got lots to talk about. Yeah, and I mean, came here to talk about your film. You we're going to take a moment now, rest where you are, and we'll just uh, have a look at uh, the local news, the regional news, where you are now. We'll see you in a bit. Uh, welcome back. We're going to talk to Oliver Stone now. He is, of course, one of Hollywood's most successful and controversial directors. His Oscar-winning movies have tackled a host of contemporary political and cultural issues, from the Vietnam War in Platoon to corporate greed in Wall Street and political conspiracy in JFK. Well, later this year, his eagerly awaited sequel to Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, is being released. He's currently there in the UK to talk about his latest film, a documentary. It's called South of the Border, and it focuses on the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, and socialism in South America. So we'll have more from Oliver in just a moment. First, though, here is a scene from South of the Border about the 2002 coup attempt in Venezuela. Chavez's reforms provoked fierce resistance from the country's oligarchy. They controlled the Venezuelan media and used it to foment opposition. They also mobilized support within the military and received help from the United States and Spain. Pienso que lo más razonable para el señor presidente de la República y su gabinete es que o presenten voluntariamente su renuncia o bueno o desaparezcan del país. A businessman. Pedro Carmona was chosen to be the new president. He supposedly flew to Madrid to be measured for a presidential sash. El golpe contra Chávez tuvo un motivo, petróleo. Oil. Bush planificó. Primero, Chávez. Chávez. Petróleo. Oil. Segundo, Second, Saddam. Hussein, Saddam Iraq. Hussein. Iraq. La causa de la, del golpe en Venezuela. The cause of y de la invasión a Irak, coup in Venezuela and the Iraq invasion. It's petróleo. So Oliver, that was you talking to Hugo Chavez, and you conducted a series of interviews with him. Just do the timeline thing for us there. The coup was the in 2002. Uh, uh, yeah, 2002, and it, ultimately it was a people's uprising which brought Hugo Chavez That's back correct. into power. It's an amazing story. Quickly, yeah, the people poured into the streets of Caracas and all over the country. A million people showed up. They wanted their elected leader back. And the uh, soldiers could not kill him. He, he goes into detail about the soldiers liking him. He was a soldier. He is a soldier still in his heart. And they just couldn't shoot him. And uh, they brought him back from the island. And he, he came back within 48 hours. And the United States never acknowledged it. They always said they were not involved in it, but they are. And we show documents to that effect in the movie. Even the New York Times uh, grudgingly, uh, grudgingly apologized for running an editorial supporting the coup. <coughs> 
It started out, you described it as a political road trip with him initially in Venezuela and others. Where did the sort of the gem, that the seed of the idea come from? Why did you feel so strongly that you wanted well, to make Well, I've done this? Salvador movie. I don't know if you saw it in 1986. With, it was about Central America and I'd come back from Vietnam and I saw this mess in Central America where we were involved, again, the U.S. with death squads, with right-wing governments torturing people against the poor, against reform, and killing leaders left and right in all these countries. The, the San, I don't know, you remember the Sandinistas in mm -hmm. Nicaragua? They were, yeah. they were attacked constantly by the Contras. I wasn't aware of all that and tried to... And then I did uh, the Castro, two Castro documentaries because I got his opinion of things, which we don't get in the U.S. Years later, uh, I went back, and I, I li I'm for the underdogs, generally speaking, and I like... Uh, what does that come from, your sense of justice? I don't know, just you know that sense of... Uh, Sense of, you're born with it or you're not, you know, it's in you or not. So I, I felt that Chavez was, you know, getting this constant denunciation in our press, and I went, I was curious. And I went, and frankly, he isn't at all what is pictured. And uh, he told me, don't believe me, go out and talk to my neighbors. And, with, and he gave us access to six other countries, helped us, and we talked to the president, seven presidents, and we did this road trip, which, and you have to understand that the movie is based on their testimony, like talking to seven presidents in the course of that film. And briefly, of course, it's a 101 introduction. I'm not saying it's in depth, but it's very important that you get a sense that the entire region has been transformed socially. The poor people of, those, of, that, of these countries have been helped by these democratically elected leaders. They're putting the money back into the country as opposed to the traditional way of taking it out of the country with rich exiles or rich, rich uh, Venezuelans, rich uh, South Americans and multinational corporations. Can I ask you one thing? Uh, well, I assume one of the points of you making the film was to give people another side of the story. You perceive yeah. that there is this, this sort of to media redress which balance, hands, yeah. Uh, yeah, particularly in the American press, some of the yeah. right-wing press there about what Not he is. Not just the right-wing press. It is the New York Times and Washington Post. It's a mainstream press. But, I mean, some of the film, well, we didn't really see it there. You get a chance to spend some time with him. You know, you go out driving around with him. You film him doing various things. Yeah. And he's obviously a hugely charismatic man. He's been re-elected twice by significantly increasing majorities. Yeah, but I know some people are already saying that your portrait of him is one-sided in itself. Sure. That you didn't, I mean, did you ask him, for example, if you could go into the prisons and talk to any of the people he's accused no. of locking up for political reasons. I know, but I know, I know about that because I've been reading these reports, and I, there's no, you know, I can pursue all these avenues. He's always, you know, you can nitpick about this. You can say well, human I'm not, rights. I'm not you can say terrorism. I'm just asking as a journalist. But if you follow you that, that, was part of the that wasn't my my job. Was to introduce to you a picture of an entire continent that's, un, that's undergoing change. There's a big picture here, and then you can get into the details. Did you want to details, interview so to some of his opponents? But there's no pattern of repression in in Venezuela. You can go out in the street and yell. Uh, anti-Chavez uh, slogans and print them anywhere you want, by the way. This is a, the press, you have to realize, in these countries is owned by a few families. They're rich and they're fiercely oppositional. They're almost political press. They call this coup a media coup. They called it that for that reason because the media didn't even cover it when Chavez came back to power. They didn't even run it on television when their own president came back. But so the should, abuse on human rights is coming from the right, and they're focusing on Chavez and saying he's the enemy instead of saying that, look, this is a fight between right and left, between the rich and the poor. But basically. sticking to the documentary, do you accept that point, that if it had been more balanced and perhaps objective... Well, that's that, fair that, and that balanced. Is the... Fox News fair and balanced. I mean, what's fair and balanced? I should interview five people on the street and three of them will, will be anti-Chavez, two will be pro-Chavez. It's nonsense. They have an election for that reason. There's human rights reports up the... Up the you know, you can write them forever. But you know what? Each case is different. And each case, there's a tremendous reform going on in this country. But there's no pattern of repression. He's not throwing people into jail. Like, I was in Eastern Europe making, writing a script uh, in the 1980s under Brezhnev. I saw all those countries. That's a dictatorship. That was censorship. This is not even, this is comparatively co to the region, compare it to Colombia, where you want to go for your honeymoon. Colombia is a horror show. They kill people there, for real. Mexico, a horror show. Honduras. There was a coup in Honduras last year, which the United States did nothing about. It's a horror show. Seven journalists have disappeared. You don't see that in the headlines, but you see anything that Chavez does. He, you know, 
there's a, somebody gets arrested and he complains because he's a friend of Chavez that I'm a, I'm a political prisoner and it gets a headline. Well, it's not fair. Oliver, you will understand this is television and our time is very short. Thank you so much for coming That's in this so morning. That's so fast. Yeah. Will you come and talk I, to us again about Wall Street? The, soon, I hope. Uh, yeah. Do that, please. It comes out in October 1. Thank October you very much. October 1, South of the Border opens in cinemas, UK and Ireland on July the 30th. Oliver Stone, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you, Kate. Bye-bye. Have a good honeymoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Stay where you are for a moment if you would. Bye-bye. Oh, okay.